What is up, guys, gals, and non-binary pals? Welcome to my Twitch channel. My name is John. I am the Tattooed Historian. I want to thank uh, May Delena. I hope I'm saying that right. Thank you for the follow 10 hours ago. And Analog Explosions. I know I can get that one right. Thank you for the follow a little less than an hour ago. Really appreciate everyone hanging out for this evening's presentation uh, with my guest tonight, Dr. Ann Ladium McDivitt. Ann, thank you for being here. Yeah, no problem. Also, that's myself and my brother uh, that, that oh. followed you. So, yay! Did I did I say the names right? I know analog explosions. Is analog right. explosions is pretty easy. Yeah, Madalena is the other one. It's Anne Lady. I'm backwards. Oh wow. Okay, I need more coffee to do that. Uh, well, <laughs> nobody ever figures it out until I tell them that that's what it is, and they're like, oh <laughs> yep. right. It's now like, I'll that's see what it. it is. Yeah, now I'll see it. That's perfect. Yeah, uh, thanks for the Warcraft. <laughs> yes, uh, for everyone. Uh, Tuning in for tonight's presentation. Thank you again. Uh, Dr. Ann Lady and McDevitt is the author of the first book in the Greuters video games and the humanity series, Hot Tubs and Pac-Man, Gender and the Early Video Game Industry in the United States. I have my copy right here. Thank you, Greuter. Uh, there we go. There, there it is. There we go. Got that in the background there. Uh, her research focuses on the history of video games, obviously, including the video game industry and media with a particular interest in gender. In her free time, she plays video games and co-hosts a podcast about video games, anime, and manga. You can follow her on Twitter, and I will put her Twitter at the bottom, at oh. Anladium. And we also have her blog for in the chat, and I will post that uh, momentarily. So, Anne, I have to know right up front, okay. what was the first video game system that you used? Oh, man. Um, the first video game system, that probably was the NES, actually. Um, okay. my, my mom will tell you, and uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I think she's watching, but um, hopefully this is correct, Mom. Please forgive me if not. Um, but she jokes that uh, I played Mickey Mouse Capade on the NES before I could even like talk in full sentences. Nice. Uh, and that game is actually super hard. Like I've tried to replay it as an adult. Like how mm -hmm. did I do this as a child? But yeah, um, yeah. NES was like the, the formative years. And um, then obviously moved to the, the Super Nintendo and uh, went from there. Nice. Nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was the same way with Paperboy. That was mm. my favorite on NES. And I played it as an adult and I'm like, I have no idea what the hell I'm doing. No <laughs> idea. Yeah. It's like it's like you gave me two left hands. I'm like, i I don't know what I'm doing here. It's it's crazy how much your hand eye coordination changes. It's so hard. like I can't even get past like the second level in Mickey Mouse Paid now. <laughs> and I feel like I I've grown as a human and as like someone with hands. Uh but but yeah. it's just not not happening anymore. Yeah, you'd think bigger bigger hands as an adult would give you an advantage, and it's like, no, that's not it. Yeah, maybe so. it's the the weird like square controller that it just works better with like baby hands. Yeah, maybe that might Who be. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask you, Anne, what uh, what have you studied previously in your uh, years coming up through your master's degree and into your doctoral degree, and what do you do now? Yeah, uh, so that's actually an interesting question because I was not uh, originally going to study video games uh, at all academically. I just played them. And um, I was doing public history for my master's. So specifically looking at um, museums and curation was what I was interested mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. um, and I ended up doing uh, an exhibit for the uh, more cultural complex in Central Florida that is a is civil rights area. Um, okay. So it's it's um it's a park that has a recreation of the homes of of the Moor or the home of the Moors uh, mm -hmm. that was actually uh, detonated with um, dynamite on Christmas Eve, Christmas Day um, by the KKK and um, killed them. And so I ended up working with them and making an exhibit that went from 1865 to 1965, looking at the civil rights movement in Florida, comparing it to the national movement. And that was wonderful. And it was a fantastic experience. And it also made me realize I can't do civil rights for the rest of my life because I will be extremely depressed trying to study this and trying to make sure that 
I get the correct information out there. I, I can't do it. Um, mm -hmm. So I kind of had a little bit of a, a panic moment of, okay, well, you're already here. What do you do now? Right. Um, and I had a conversation with my mentor, who is a fabulous human being. And he asked me what I liked and I told him games. So he said, do that. Mm -hmm. um, so after my, my big panic moment, um, I just started looking into like game magazines and seeing, you know, what can I do here? And um, that led to the master's um, thesis. Yes, you were yelling. The master's thesis um, that then led into the dissertation that then led into the book. And um, so that's the journey to where we got uh, uh, now. And um, current research, actually, uh, I wish I had the box with me, but it's at my office um, at work. Uh, I'm looking at a magazine right now from 1999 to 2000. It only ran for like nine months and it is the shittiest game magazine I think you'll ever see. Um, nice. Like it's it's trying to be a combination of like Maxim magazine and a game magazine. Okay. And also putting in a lot of wrestling. And oh, so wow. it's, it's, it's basically like an ultimate dude bro magazine. <laughs> Oh my God. And I found the complete run of it and have been going through and looking at the advertisements and what kind of language they're using. And it's, it's wow. pretty fascinating. Well, I can, I can say that I didn't have a subscription to that, but I, I think I had a subscription to Maxim in the late nineties. So I'm, I'm kind of half dude, bro. In that kinda way, bro. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, I, I yeah. Yeah, I remember those days. So yeah, when you brought that up, it's like, oh, that's that's bad memories in a way. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, it's it's wild, and you have stuff like um, just angry raging about Pikachu, like this man who has this really really a bad obsession with Pikachu and how he wants to harm Pikachu, and wow. like, dude, like you you need therapy because Pikachu did nothing to you, <laughs> right? And he just keeps bringing it up. He was like one of the editors of the the magazine, and. Uh, then you have stuff like really awfully sexist um, spreads of Claire Redfield. And also, let's just throw in a, a sprinkle of racism while we're at it. Why not? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. it, it's it's a horrific magazine, but it's an interesting one to go through. So that's my current research project. Wow. That mm -hmm. sounds <laughs> really interesting for a short lived thing. At least your at least your data set is kind of quote small compared yes. to a lot of other things yeah yeah and um i think that that's part of why i picked it is because i wanted to see what was what was going on in this little microcosm of like odd game magazines that only lasted nine months like what what is in there what worked what didn't um my goodness <laughs> and, and what kind of <laughs> he wants he wants to say his opinion about the magazine i guess i think so um but yeah it's it's just a bizarre like snapshot of that that period of time and like what kinds of language was that was going into these kinds of magazines what kind of ads were going in and obviously this is like a, a special example of a magazine and that not every game magazine was like that but the fact that it was even in existence for a while says something in and of itself right right, so. right. about pop culture and ideas of you know, gender and stuff like that. Yeah, it's really interesting. It's it's wild. And I now yes. know way more about wrestling than I ever thought that I would. Um, <laughs> yes. Going through that. Yes. And that's straight up attitude era. And that's like over the top masculinity. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I know that era. Yeah, I remember that well. Um, uh, the uh, What I liked uh, early on in Hot Tubs and Pac-Man Remember one is from De Gruyter, and thank you, De Gruyter, for this <laughs> lovely hardback to me. What I liked early on was something that we have discussions about in uh, public history with historical memory, mm -hmm. where we often say it's so fluid. Mm -hmm. And you say the same thing in here uh, about gender, uh, you know, being the idea of gender, but also how we talk about gender mm -hmm. is consistently fluid. It's It's kind of a parallel course. Uh, would you say that's something that a lot of people who not only will see it in the video game industry, but see it in different areas, that's something we have to get through uh, to ourselves that 
you know, the, the idea of gender norms as far as how we talk about things or how we perceive things is consistently fluid, just like historical memory is consistently fluid. Yeah, uh, I think that a lot of folks think about gender in very rigid ways. Um, they think, you know, this is the way that a man would present masculinity. This is a way that a, a woman would do femininity. And that's it. That's the only way. And that's obviously not the case. There are many different ways things change. And my goodness, <laughs> he's why? Expressing his opinion. Why, Maxwell? <laughs> Maxwell um, wants on. He wants on. Yeah, he, he, he definitely wants on. He wants to take the question. Hey, buddy. Um, stop, stop mansplaining, Maxwell. We're trying to get this gender thing done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, Max. Come on. <laughs> um. And so thinking about gender in a way that it is not so rigid and thinking about the different even types of masculinity, like I, I talk about in the book of the the like geek masculinity. And um, even I think there's a point where I'm talking about like a, a, a techno sexuality type thing. Uh, mm -hmm. all, all of that is is very it changes and it's even changing into the research that I'm doing now. It's different from when I was writing in like the 70s and 80s, um, obviously these things change. There are some consistencies, um, but I don't think that people always really think about how how these things do change and that you're gonna have to look at different perspectives of you know what was actually going on here based on what, what the idea of gender was at the time as well. Um, and that's obviously going to be very, very different from like 1920s masculinity is going to be right. very different from 1970s masculinity. Right, right. It's still masculinity in the U.S., but very, very different versions of it. When you started your dissertation idea, which which led to uh, this work or, or parts of this work, what made you decide to go to go this route? timeline wise what made you want to go to the 19 it seems like most of the most of the book is 1970s 1980s mm -hmm. uh and and i remember a lot of the 80s but, you know, <laughs> like one of those things where it's like okay i remember you know i remember some of this stuff but not as far as you know being an adult but i remember you know the games and i remember once new stuff would come out and i remember who was standing there playing them Mm -hmm. and i re i remembered that through your book as well because i'm like okay this is really interesting what uh what led you to go into that time frame of video game history and be like this is a really unique time to be talking about this yeah so the book actually it says like 50s but that's mainly because mm -hmm. i want to talk a little bit about pinball because pinball is an important precursor um but the yeah. 70s and 80s are really the the core of this book and the 70s primarily because that's when all of this starts to become an important thing um, you could say that the 60s uh, with, with Space War, there was some movement towards it. But once you get Atari out there, it, it's just blowing up. Um, and I think that part of that was also driven by the fact that the documentation that I could find about the atmosphere of places like Atari and Broderbund, um, I, I was able to find that. And so obviously, we kind of need that as historians. What can I find? What can I not find? Right. Um, I could find that. It was great. And so that is what started more of the, the beginning of it. Um, the end is a little bit more arbitrary, but I do want to talk about some of the middle parts. Mm -hmm. The 80s are a super, super important time um, to the video game industry, especially looking at um, the, the entrance of women as developers and um, women and girls as game players. Uh, that was a really, really unique point in time and that there was active advertisement towards girls and women. Um, there, there were, like I said, developers actually making the games and them trying to hire women to put different touches on games, even if it is a very stereotypical idea of what does a woman want in a game? Like I, there's right. a game that um i always think about that i don't even think i mentioned it in the book but it was called um like sweeping or something and mm. it's literally just about you cleaning the floor <laughs> oh my gosh yeah yeah um wow. probably a good reason why that didn't really go anywhere but yeah <laughs> um so yeah what what do women want oh i don't know they want to clean the floor yeah. i guess 
Um, yeah. Yeah. But that's why I want to have fun. Yeah. 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 Isn't that fun to you to, to mop the floor? Right. Uh, so you have that, that really, really fascinating point in time that ends up essentially breaking down because of that crash. And so I ended it in around 85 um, for the most part because of the release of the NES. Mm -hmm. um, you have a whole different ball game in terms of advertisement, in terms of how video games are just perceived in general. And then obviously you have a difference of Japan becomes a really, really prominent force in the game industry worldwide. And that's not something that you had as much of before. So Japan kind of usurps the United States of being like the game maker at that point. And um, also, obviously for practical reasons, I don't know Japanese. So makes it really kind of hard to, to do any of the documentation there. Uh, yeah. Maybe in the future <laughs> I will learn it, but um, you know, practical right. reasons. And also it just makes for a, a nice little end point and that this is where things really do start to shift. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that is that all basically about accessibility as well? I mean, I remember that consoles, NES and all that stuff were expensive at the time, yeah. you know, for us to have. People think, oh, it's $500 for like a PlayStation you know, 5 or whatever, or seven, eight hundred dollars for it. Back in the day, the NES was a lot of money for a lot of us in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a luxury. Do you think that accessibility started to kind of tear down those barriers or just basically entrench them more that's actually an interesting question um because part of what what you end up seeing happening is is the difference of marketing so with nes you end up getting like the bundle with the rob and yeah. the the um zapper and so you end up feeling like you're getting more when when you're actually just buying like a little accessories like people don't usually talk about rob anymore outside of smash at this point because right. nobody really used Rob. Right. Um, but Rob was specifically there to make people think, okay, well, this is, this is fun. This is accessible. This is safe. We're good. Um, but it also added a little bit more value in that you have, Oh, this robot and this, this fancy gun. Mm -hmm. And I think that that made it a little bit easier than, cause like the Atari 2600 was pretty expensive at the time that oh, yeah. it came out too. Um, so I think that it's always been somewhat of a, a luxury item in the sense that, you know, it, it's going to take a pretty penny to, to get you one of those. And that's not mm -hmm. really changed. I mm -hmm. accidentally got a PS5 and I'm still amazed. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. yeah. Um, I was actually doing some work around the, the office today and it was so timely that we were going to do this tonight because the Who's pinball wizard came on today. Nice. And I was like, now I'm starting to think of it differently now because you talked about pinball in the early part of the book and mm -hmm. it was like the, the gender history of pinball, which I had never considered before. Really? Was that, was that yeah, I never thought of it. Like I, I just never thought of it. I have a girlfriend who plays pinball. I mean, it's just like, you know, I don't, don't think about it that much. And mainly by the time I started hanging out in arcades, we were going away from pinball. We were going right. to electronic uh, sets and stuff. So tell us about that, uh, that kind of gender history of pinball, because that was really surprising even to me and I'm going on uh, a little over 40. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I really felt that it was important for me to talk about pinball generally because it, it's really unfair to just talk about video games and it's on its own because it really mm -hmm. does owe a lot to pinball. Um, even in terms of like, oh, hey, moral panics, yay. Um, but I just found some really fascinating stuff when I was researching some of the, the history of pinball. Um, in particular, I was really enjoying reading some of the articles that were talking about like the physicality of, yeah. of playing pinball. I never thought of this. I didn't either. I did not think about it. And then I was reading these and it came up several times in different places that people were talking about the physicality and like the use of the hips um, to, to, to play pinball. Mm -hmm. And um, I just felt like that had to be mentioned because it, it is a really, really gendered way of looking at pinball. Like, okay, well, we're looking at this guy who's really good at pinball and he's very good at making, making the tilts happen. But then we're also thinking about him in a sexual way because of the way that he's playing right. pinball. Um, right. And also, if a lady's doing that, then, you know, she's 
she's a loose lady because she's doing the same thing that a guy can do and that's not okay. Right. Um, yeah. But yeah, I just, I found all of that and it was just mind blowing for me because I had also never really thought about pinball in that way. I, I've mm -hmm. never really been super big into pinball. Mm -hmm. um, right. I'm going to blame the fact that I'm super short. <laughs> yeah, I could play against you. No, yeah, no yeah, pun yeah. intended. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm quite minuscule, so <laughs> it makes it a little bit hard to actually really get into it. But, um, yeah. I, I, I'm always fascinated by it, especially, uh, I, I talk a little bit about the, the art of, of the, of the, the pinball machines and, right. um, how you have some of the like sexy art that, that, um, was put on there and some of the pushback against that. And then the pushback against the pushback. And mm -hmm. um, how how there was this real mourning when some of the like sexy pinball art went away, um, as if that like actually influences the way that you play the pinball um, right. game. Like, oh no, wow, there's no yeah. more ladies in bikinis. Well, that game's obviously terrible now. Yeah, now, I remember all that, and I and and that brought back memories of okay, that is you know this gender history of pinball to me. I didn't realize the physicality. Mm -hmm. portion of it i'm like wow that's a really interesting way to look at this i never even considered that not not the way you did but the way people were seeing it as oh it must mean he's this guy's good in bed it must mean this woman is just a loose woman right it's just like what where did this come from right like my brain would never say like oh man look at that guy doing like this awesome job pinball he's obviously good in bed because right. he can he can make it tilt and like right yeah okay and then like they had <laughs> they had the absolute gall to like go out and say these things in in public and... yeah it's like, <laughs> it's like it's like watching someone playing like dance dance revolution or something right 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 and, and like, like wow he's got good moves <laughs> you know i i yeah and i mean i've watched a lot of people play dance dance revolution and uh can't say that i've ever had those kinds of thoughts about it but um right you know maybe others do right i, I don't know it's, I mean, teach their own. Yeah, who am I to judge? I'm not going to judge. Maybe, maybe they're right and we're wrong. I, maybe, <laughs> they something, maybe they see something we don't. I, I don't know. Uh, um, if it works for them, that's fine. Yeah, it was just so um, strange. I loved it. Yeah, it, it, it was really interesting from that transition from the old pinball hall, basically, mm -hmm. you know, in the in the corner of a bar or or whatever. And I remember them even in the back of a barber shop where yeah. I grew up, you would see mm -hmm. a pinball machine in the back and whatever, uh, which also told me that the guy cutting hair usually takes a long time if I have time to play pinball between all this stuff. But you see this transition into, you know, the cabinets and, uh, and visuals and electronic gaming and, and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And you talked about women in the industry as far as being developers and such. Right. But you also underscore in the book that you're talking about white women yes you know this is this isn't a complete shattering of the glass ceiling early mm -hmm. on this is this is far from it no no this is this is entirely white women um and and i even mentioned in the book at one point that um there's this the, there's the atari newsletter that um i was reading through and sometimes they would highlight people who were in different parts of atari mm -hmm. and um even like in the assembly line, like who are these people and like what what are their stories? We don't really get those stories because usually they're like women of color or um, you know some I don't know. There's some some men of color there too, um, and and you don't get as much of that whenever you're going through the documentation. You might get a picture of them. You might get a like oh you know she likes to cook for her husband. Okay, cool. Like how is that a personality trait? Right. Um, but you don't really get to learn a lot about them like you do some of the developers. And um, I, I, I think that that's really sad. And I know that um, Carly, who is also a, a video game historian, um, Carly has mentioned a few times, like, you know, the, these people really do need to be highlighted because they made everything work. They made these these actual cabinets. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, we don't know as much about them. And, and so that's kind of heartbreaking and I hope that we can change that and maybe we can like get some oral histories from them or something that'd be fantastic so that we can see a different side of of the industry and different perspectives uh, because the, yeah this is a a story of white women who are making games mm -hmm. so it was a change but it wasn't a complete change right 
Right. Uh, how did these women try at the time to change things, whether it's a culture within mm -hmm. their office or something in the gaming world itself, as far as in game or whatever, how did they try to uh, fight back, if you will, against that? Because again, we're talking about the 1980s this or, or yeah. late seventies, early eighties. This is a different time as far as you're not going to be able to post it on social media that you're right. fighting back. <laughs> you know, Right. Right. Yeah. And, um, and something as simple, simple as Donna Bailey deciding, I really like pastels. So I'm going to put pastels in centipede. Um, mm. You know, that that was something that was her decision. And I, I do find it really fascinating that there was a recent release of Centipede and I don't remember how recent it was, but um, they talk about how Ed Log was the, the developer on it. And then like an unnamed uh, developer, like co-developer. I'm like, we know who did it. We know you guys know who did it. Like, why yeah. are we not giving her credit? But, um, you know, Donna has kind of, stepped away from the industry. She she still talks a little bit about it and has done some interviews and um, is a, a very, very nice person. Um, but, you know, she she ended up having to leave because it was just not not something that she she really could do um, because of a lot of the like bro atmosphere. And I, I talk about that quite a bit that that she she felt like it was kind of like a frat being mm -hmm. at Atari. Right. And um, she was the only woman in the coin op division um, developing. And so that that makes it hard. You have somebody who, you know, they're putting in internal advertisements that never got released that they're like, oh, well, let's make her into a hooker, basically. OK, cool. You know, you guys are the ones who are playing the games and you're going to make her into a hooker. All right. Mm -hmm. Nice. Mm -hmm. um, and so. I, I do think that it is um, really fascinating that we do get some different kinds of game um, design choices. Like I said, the colors. Um, and even then she's like, yeah, that's not gendered. The dudes like the pastels too. It's different. Um, and everybody else marketed as like, oh, this is so feminine to have pastel colors. Oh my <laughs> yeah. Uh, right. yeah. Yeah. This isn't hard colors anymore. It's not masculine. Right, right. And like, I, yeah. I, um, I'm blanking on her name, but um, Joust, you know, there's nothing really like super feminine about Joust. Um, mm. But w there was a woman co-developer who made Joust. Uh, and there's nothing really specifically there that is a feminine touch as they were trying to add in. Um, you you had a lot of the, the, the top dogs at the industry saying, you know, we got to have a little bit of femininity, a little feminine touch. They, they have a different design idea and it's like and it's like ostriches like what are you talking about <laughs> right <laughs> um so i i think that even being a part of that industry at the time was a form of just fighting back that they were able to um utilize the skills that they had and a lot of them you know were learning it on their own um i know that mm -hmm. with uh roberta williams in sierra um you know she was just playing a lot of games and decided, well, I want to make my own. Here's a bunch of drawings. Can you make this into a game? And, uh, you know, became one of the most prominent game developers that was a woman in, in the 80s. So, you know, that was her just being interested after running out of games to play. Hmm. Mm -hmm. You're like, well, I guess I'm out, so I'm going to make my own. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> if it's not there, make your own, mm -hmm. you, know? <laughs> you know, in that way and, and make a mark on the industry in that way. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, in the title, you have Hot Tubs and Pac-Man. Mm -hmm. And uh, how did Pac-Man change the landscape? What caught, what created that earthquake in the industry? Yeah, um, Pac-Man is kind of a, a pivotal moment there. And I, I really like to talk about Pac-Man quite a bit. Uh, mm -hmm. My mom actually got me a nice little, um, like, two-foot-tall Pac-Man cabinet that I keep in my office oh, yeah. at work that I can play. Nice. Um, yeah, so Pac-Man is different in multiple ways. One, Pac-Man brings in a, a character that is very marketable, um, even though he looks absolutely ridiculous in the original version of Pac-Man on the art. He's just like this like yellow blob with feet. Um, yes. He's hideous. Yes. Um, but he's he's marketable, and there's a story behind it because you, you have 
names and you have the ghosts. Um, so it becomes something that you can actually build out beyond just having the, the arcade cabinet. This is something that we can do merch. Oh, wow. Um, right. But it, it was also pretty accessible gameplay wise because all you had to, yeah, his giant nose. Yes. Um, all, all you had to do was use the, the joystick. There was no real complicated control scheme that you had to, to deal with. Right. So it's easy for newcomers to really get involved with it. Um, and that was that was a big deal. I mean, when you don't have to think about, well, you know, which buttons do I press and how do I play this? It's just one thing that you have to do. Um, that makes it a lot easier. And that makes it easy for people who are intimidated by it as well, um, which mm -hmm. is one reason why I was I will always, always, always advocate that like easy mode, easy mode's fine in playing games because let's yes. make things accessible and right. um you know sometimes people just don't have time to play games on super super hard levels so um, anyway <laughs> that's, that's, that's a true. divergence um yes. but uh yeah pac-man was accessible and it was the first game that was explicit in trying to reach women um mm -hmm. iwatani was saying you know i i kept seeing all of these these arcades and they were dark and they were dingy and it's not really a good place to to take a date um so he was thinking explicitly well what what do we do to try and make it more appealing to women and um i i, I still take issue with the whole like oh well they like eating so let's let's make pac-man eat everybody likes to eat i don't know what you're talking about yeah. um but you know you have the characters you have the bright colors you have the simple control scheme uh, there's just a lot there that makes it really, really interesting and, and um, different. And once you do have more people coming in and playing stuff like Pac-Man, um, you have them also going to cabinets and trying to learn different games. You you have them trying out like much harder games when they used to, to Pac-Man. And mm -hmm. so you open up who is actually playing games, who's actually interested in games. Uh, by having this one game that can kind of be a, a little gateway into it. Um, and then obviously Pac-Man was able to become a cultural phenomenon. You have the awful song. Um, you have a lot of merch. I, I actually have a, a Pac-Man picture disc downstairs, like a vinyl. Oh, wow. Um, that it, it's um, got Pac-Man uh, and then like the Pac family on the other side. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. it ends up giving like this strange backstory of like, oh, Pac-Man's hanging out in the sewers with his ghost friends and not paying any attention to Miss Pac-Man. And she's sad. She's going to sing about it. And... Yep. Okay. That's, that's yeah. The, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's that's the 80s. We were coming down off the LSD around that time. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's all cocaine all the time now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. What yeah. Are, what, yeah. What is the what is the story with Ms. Pac-Man? Because you know, Pac-Man comes out first, and now there's a Ms. Pac-Man. And I was I was kind of intrigued by this idea of like Ms. Pac-Man and pac-man and adam and eve kind of thing where she comes from his rib and it's like yeah. wow this is really getting deep here now <laughs> you know <laughs> i'm loving it but it's getting really deep here yeah um because miss pac-man is actually originally just a mod of the original pac-man so mm -hmm. you know we we think of mods a lot now with like pc gaming um but the the guys who made miss pac-man essentially saw pac-man and the the, the um, board and said okay well this is too easy and you know there's the one spot that you can go to that you're safe um and you know we want to make this harder so they end up doing this like mod board that you can then plug into a regular pac-man machine and um make it have different levels and different patterns and um obviously that did not go over well because oh hey you can't just mod our games what are you doing mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. but it ended up benefiting them in the sense that they were just tapped in to make okay well just make a sequel make miss pac-man um and they were thinking of it explicitly as okay well there were a lot of women and girls who were interested in pac-man let's make miss pac-man as like a thank you 
um, for for them playing the original game um, as, as if a bow is like the way that we say thank you. Yeah. And the the weird like femme fatale artwork that went along with Miss Pac-Man. Like pearls and like all kinds of stuff. It, the fur, the fur and yeah, the, the, the fur. heels. And it, it's it's yeah. bizarre. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and then you have the whole um, kerfluffle with you know, how do we actually name her? Because we don't want it to be uh, Miss Pac-Man because there's a Pac baby and we can't have the, the Pac family having a baby out of wedlock. So, um, but we yeah. don't want it to be MRS Pac-Man because, you know, that makes her sound like she's like an, an old dodgy lady. So we're gonna go MS. So there's a little bit of mystery there. That's right, low intrigue. Yeah, yeah, all right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And so um, it, it became this this like big add on, like you said, it it was the whole idea of like Adam and Eve of like Miss mm -hmm. Pac-Man was literally birthed out of the original Pac-Man version because it was just originally a plug in to the original uh, original cabinet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, yeah, I was like, yeah, OK, mind blown now. I never thought of it this way, <laughs> um, you know, it. The the one thing, Ann, that I've really, really liked, I love uh I love artwork and I love I love the artwork of not only video games, I love the artwork of all kinds of stuff. Like I own mm -hmm. posters that are historically based and you know from the first world war and stuff, just I love art. Mm -hmm. And I never thought of the artwork behind advertising posters of games, but now I find like, I'm I'm looking them up on eBay now because I'm like, mm -hmm. this is just something I might have to have to be like, look at how we thought in the eighties <laughs> about, about uh, video games. What, what were some of the ones that you really, uh, I, I don't want to turn, use the term appreciated, but uh, I mean that in the, uh, in the negative sense, maybe of the word where it's like, wow, you really put that on a poster. Um, I mean, I'm still in awe that gotcha ever was a thing and yes. that they specifically put, um, a, a, a man chasing a woman and she's in like a lingerie looking outfit. Yeah. Um, and then you have the very obvious orb control scheme in the background. And you're like, wow. Okay. And um, I, yep. I have looked in the Atari design documents and there is a sketch of that cabinet that has, you know, the orbs and then there's a face where the screen would be. And so there's no question on like what they were going for there. Wow. even if they try to play coy about it now. Um, so that one in particular, I'm still just like, wow, that was, that was something that you thought was a good idea. Um, <laughs> I, I, I also, um, I put it, I think it's actually the cover of the book. Um, there is an ad that I, oh. I, I think is framed in a very interesting way in the sense that you have this young girl and her mom and then you have a businessman and then you have just like a regular guy and there are three different cabinets. And um, yes. so it's, it's trying to show off like, you know, this is, this is how it, it your arcade can look. Um, right. But it also shows a form of what is acceptable and what's not acceptable for people to actually play um, because it, she's either playing Pac-Man or Miss Pac-Man. I can't remember which one she's playing and she has her mom there. And um, yeah, it's grocery yeah, shopping. She's, uh, yeah, she's playing Ms. Pac-Man. It's kind of Pac hard. To, it's kind of hard to see, uh, but you can see, you can see the shopping bag down here mm -hmm. behind the two ladies. You know, yeah. and the, and the businessmen have their the other guy's a businessman, and they have their the briefcase briefcases there, and it showcases this idea of you're you're insinuating that you're assuming because of gender norms at the time you're assuming they mm -hmm. mean these two women just got done getting the groceries yep you know and stuff and then here's the the gotcha yep <laughs> uh so you know if you're looking for something for uh christmas uh yeah for your for your gamer friends <laughs> there you go uh just find a and, gotcha poster somewhere <laughs> yeah i just you just get a gotcha poster i mean i have like the monster posters i can't put on screen so <laughs> <laughs> uh for monster energy drink so they're like get some good quality art for your office and i'm like oh this will work and uh so yeah there's still some of that you know going on there going back to that maxim magazine thing um but yeah i i really 
enjoyed that part of the book because I, as I say, I really appreciate art, obviously being tattooed, you're into art. Uh, many people who are tattooed are into art unless they get it in like cell block D or something like that. Same. And then, <laughs> you know, uh, but yeah, it's, it's really an interesting thing to consider. And I never thought of it that way. Like I remember the art on pinball machines being really mm -hmm. risque. And I remember mm -hmm. some of the side panels on the cabinets being a little bit, you know, uh, dr kind of crossing that line. But I never thought about the art on posters, but it's obvious that it would be taking on that kind of thing. And the shock value is leading you to want to know what is actually going on with this particular game. Right. And actually you remind me with the pinball statement. Um, I recently, and I don't remember the game, but I saw uh, a particular pinball machine that had on the sidebar of it, a woman like lounging. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was thinking of it in the context of what I was writing and what they were saying about like, oh, you know, a guy who can do the tilt, you know, he's, he's good in bed. I'm like, you literally have this guy just like thrusting at a woman who's like lying down on the sides oh here. Like, <laughs> I didn't even think about that at all until like I, right. I, I saw that and I had done this research. I'm like, oh, okay, well, we're not being subtle then at all. Right, right. Yeah. If they would have had TikTok back then. I know, I know. Made some amazing videos and been like, look at how look how this looks in real life. You know? I, I think everybody would have gotten in so much trouble if like one, we had some of the yeah. the ideas of gender now. And mm -hmm. two, if they had had TikTok, because they had some really, really terrible decisions that were actually never publicized. And that was a good thing, even though we know about them. Um, but mm -hmm. ugh, mm -hmm. like the the Atari football one with the, the topless lady, um, like that wasn't released, thankfully. Um, but, you know, oh, the, the woman can only win an Atari football because she took off her shirt and the guy's distracted. Like, uh. Oh, that, that was a good idea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah it was kind of like that thing in the early late 90s early 2000s the same time as that magazine when they had like the lingerie football league yeah yeah it's, like, it's that time period it's that thing it's the shock value and, mm -hmm. and stuff so yeah it's what what wild times uh, <laughs> uh and <laughs> i have to know uh and i know i'm sure a lot of people watching want to know where did you do your research at? Are there ar archival holdings of these and in corporate headquarters or are they in, in you know, things you find at gaming cons where you can buy different uh, books and stuff to figure out where to go archivally? Where do you find your information at? So um, I'm going to give a giant plug here. Um, mm -hmm. The archive at the Strong Museum of Play in Rochester, New York um, is absolutely phenomenal. They have any of the like Atari design documents. They have uh, their like Atari collection, um, including the newsletters. They have a huge amount of game magazines you can just go through. Nice. That archive is amazing, and I, I, I loved it. I loved going through it. The people there are fantastic, and they super duper want to help you out. You say like, "Oh, hey, I want to look at." Roberta Williams stuff. And they're like, well, how about also this and this and this? And my like, God, thank you. You are, you are <laughs> lovely humans. You're amazing. Um, so that that's where I did most of my archival research. Um, they are phenomenal there. And also just going to the strong museum is, is super, super fun. Uh, they have a bunch of arcade cabinets out there that you can like go play and uh, enjoy yourself. Um, and then some of the other uh, work that I was able to come up with, um, luckily, and, and, and a lot of people know this, um, there, there are a lot of fans of video games out there, amazingly. And uh, they like to scan things. And so a lot of magazines are just scanned from the 80s and um, late 70s. Oh, nice. And that's so, so helpful. Um, like uh, um, on um, Internet Archive, you can find a ton of magazines that have been scanned. Um, and I, I cannot recommend that enough because you can find some really, really cool stuff. Um, and then also I had some help from my friends and my mom. Um, you know, some of the, the things that I ended up, oh, and actually, um, the, the history librarian at, uh, George Mason, when I was doing my dissertation was a, a delightful person and helped me. Um, I was trying to go through, um, Playboy to see what kind of advertisement was there and what kind of um, articles were there. 
And he was able to find me like 20 years of Playboy on microfilm and get it ILL to me, uh, interlibrary loaned. And um, the the library at George Mason, one, they called me up to like, did, did you mean to to request 20 years of Playboy? Did you mean to do that? I'm like, yes, yes, I did. Yes. Um, and then when I went to go pick it up, like this cannot leave the library. I'm like, yes, I'm going to run off with 20 years of microfilm of Playboy. Like, right. Oh, um, <laughs> So I had to, you know, go through 20 years of Playboy on a microfilm machine in the middle of the library at George Mason. But yes. um, I'm sure somebody had a good time that was sitting behind me. Right. Um, <laughs> that was that was fun. But oh, I also cool. had friends who, um, you know, my mom ended up finding me a, a copy of a Playboy magazine that I needed for an interview with uh, Nola Bushnell. Um, I had a friend who found me a particular copy of Hustler that had um, a review of an X-rated game that I really wanted to see what their review was. Um, and so, like, it, it really was a lot of people that were coming together and finding me all kinds of crazy stuff. And uh, then some of the others was eBay. You know, you can find a lot of wild things on eBay. Yeah. So yeah. That's... A lot of where I did my work was um, the Strong Museum, the the library, um, archive, uh, internet archive, and then uh, friends helping me and my mom helping me. And I still think right. that's fantastic that my mom gifted me uh, a copy of Playboy in like my late 20s. Yes, that's fantastic. <laughs> that's Thanks, awesome. Mom. You're the yes. best. <laughs> yes. <laughs> shout out to Ann's mom for that one. She, she's and, amazing. And, and shout out to all your archivists and librarians out there because, you know, we would be nothing as historians without them. Yeah. You know, and they don't get the thanks they deserve. They so. don't. And they're so amazing. So I'm really appreciative of everybody who helped me along the way uh, and doing this research. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, what's one takeaway from the book that you would love for people to know or to understand? Like, uh, like one factor that maybe surprised you or that you really want people to, you want to drive a point home with them about this book? Uh, I think that one thing that I really want people to come away with is that um, when they go into thinking like, okay, this is a book about gender in the video game industry, um, I think that people really think it's going to be completely negative and it's not. And, and I think that that's something that is important to think about is that there were very, very important moments here um, with, with women becoming involved in, in de uh, development and playing and different ideas of what, what we can do with video games. Uh, even if it ends up being a disaster later on the road, when we have all the stupid X-rated games, um, you know, it's not all negative and it's not all me just like shitting on Nolan Bushnell because that's not what I want to do here. Right. Um, like it is, there is some really, really intriguing stuff that happened here, um, even amongst all of the dude bro nonsense. And I think that that's what I want people to take away is that there, there was some, there was some good stuff here. There is some good stuff. It's not all negativity. And um, it's hard to remember that because the the video game industry even now has so many issues with with gender and um, how we how we treat people generally. And um, so I, I do want there to be a takeaway of there were some really great women, especially in the in the early '80s, who were making some fantastic games, who were really trying to to push the envelope here, and um, they did it. Mm -hmm. And they they opened some some doors and made some really, really great games that, uh, you know, Centipede's still fantastic. I don't care what anybody says. Centipede right. is a great game. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that that's a good thing. And I right. think that I think that focusing on some of that good is is important. Right. Right. And what would you like to uh, to experience or to uh, see in the future as someone who is a gamer? Oh boy, uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I come at you with a hard hitting question, Dan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> honestly, what I really want is more inclusivity. Um, I I think that one of the the most amazing things that I saw this year was in Psychonauts two, and Psychonauts two one had a giant 
section before you even started it saying like, these are things that could be potentially triggering. Um, and it had a ton of accessibility options within it uh, to, to make the game a bit easier for everybody to play. Mm -hmm. um, including like, you could just like turn off fall damage, you could turn off damage entirely. So you could just enjoy the game. Mm -hmm. um, and I love that. I love that there are options to make it so that more people can enjoy games. Uh, and I, I, I think that it's really significant that we have people who are playing games that never have really played them before. Um, I, I want there to be more inclusivity. And I think that we're starting to get some of that. And I think that um, the, the indie scene has really been able to, to push that forward too, that we're getting a lot more of um, games that are telling some very interesting stories. Um, we're getting games that are, are really um, trying to, to push that accessibility. And that's kind of forcing other parts of the industry to, to really pay attention. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's great. Um, so we're obviously not there yet. We're, we're, we're still struggling. Um, right. Right. But I, I want I want there to be a situation where if you want to play this game, you can play it and you're not going to get judged if you go on the easy mode or if you if you turn off the, the damage for one particular part, you're like, I can't get through this, this sucks. Mm -hmm. um, or even um, the uh, the Great Ace Attorney Chronicles came out this year, and there's a mode that you can just turn off having to solve the puzzle so you can just enjoy the story. Mm -hmm. um, and so that kind of thing is great because not everybody has to use it. If you want to play the game like you would normally, cool, right. you can do that. Right. Um, but it allows more people to enjoy things that we enjoy. And I like that. And I like getting to talk to more people about things that I like. Mm -hmm. um, and I just want it to be, I want it to be so that anybody can can make the games that they want to make, um, as long as it's not like horrifically offensive. Um, and that everybody is able to play the games that they really want to play um, without giant barriers of who who gets to be the developer, who gets to be the player. I, I want that to continue to break down. So that's that's my big want. We'll see how that goes. There you go. That's, <laughs> that's, that's a great one. I hope it, I hope it happens. I hope we keep opening doors and having uh accessibility of not only the historical narrative but in our present day uh gaming community as well and yeah. uh stop the trolling <laughs> you yeah. know yeah oh my but god yes please i've banned enough people over that we're not going to have that uh mm -hmm. but yeah we there's a troll born every minute so uh we got to take care of that but it's yeah one of those things uh and and i'm really really excited uh for the future of your work because i think I'm really excited for what's going to happen with this magazine project. Uh, and I'm so excited. And I, might, I might wince a little bit when I'm like, ooh, I think I remember this now. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> yeah, I might be like, oh, I, I don't know if I should comment. Um, but yeah, I, I really loved your book. Really oh, love this. Hot Tubs you. and Pac-Man, Gender in the Early Video Game Industry in the United States. It was awesome to revisit some of my childhood and then realize how far we've come in some ways mm -hmm. and how much we have to still work. Yep. We're a work in progress. I actually have that tattooed on me because I am one. And we as a collective are a work in progress. Always. And, and uh, it's good to to know that and it's good to move forward with it. But I really, really enjoyed this book. And uh, the greater publishers put it out. Go check it out, everybody. And don't forget to go check out Anne on Twitter as well. I need to put your your Twitter name back up there and in Twitter. the comments everyone is Anne's blog as well and thank you so much for joining us this evening mm -hmm. i really really do appreciate you coming over here on twitch and hanging out with me yeah thanks for having me this was fantastic you're yeah. very welcome anytime <laughs> anytime thank you everyone who has joined us this evening thank you for the awesome numbers mr knives thank you for the follow and bourbon fan the the uh husband of stephanie ah uh, yeah also so, hi mr knives i know yes. you uh, thank you. Thank you for the resub there, Bourbon fan. Thank you, brother, for 10 months. We appreciate all of you hanging out with us this great evening. We hope you are safe and happy. Please uh, be safe and be well. And uh, we can all start going to gaming cons together and hanging out and, you know, being being around each other again. So that'd be that'd be fantastic. And, and look forward to meeting you at a, a hope, maybe a convention in the future. Yeah, and, that'd be great. Uh, hanging out. 
I I won't play pinball. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> just get weird look weird looks from Anne the entire time. I'm like, stop <laughs> Anne, stop it. Uh, <laughs> but no, it was great having you, Anne. I really appreciate you. Yeah, it was awesome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, so everyone. Much. Have a great night, everybody. Take care of yourself. Bye. See you next time. <laughs>